Hey, before I get going here, um, I, I would like to just say thank you to a few people real quick, and, and I'd love for you to help me thank them as well, but let me just get, it, get their names out there first. Um, Jess, Doug, Connor, Charlotte, Whitney, Sam, this whole team uh, of, of young adults that, you know, it takes a lot of work to pull something like this off. It not, and not, it's not just man hours, right? It's a lot of spiritual work too and a lot of prayer and a lot of work has went into this. And I know that a bunch of you already had some huge God moments last night. And I believe that's gonna continue happening throughout today and tonight and tomorrow morning. And make no mistake about it, no person is changing your life. God is speaking to you. God is changing your life. But he often uses people that are willing. And these guys have been willing. And so can you guys help me and say thank you to the young adult staff here? <clears throat> If you uh, go to Red Rocks Church, which I know a bunch of you do, um, you know that I'm from Kansas, the land of the NASCAR t-shirt, the mullet, and Copenhagen. In fact, I was given my first chew of Copenhagen by my bus driver when I was five years old in kindergarten. I mean, think about if that happened today. Like, there would be news channels and programs and, like, alert things going across the bottom of your screen, right? I went home and told my parents at five years old that my bus driver gave me Copenhagen and I puked, and they were kind of like, eh, you're about that age, you know? Like, it wasn't even a thing. Like, how does that? Kansas is just different, guys, all right? Um, where I grew up, people park in the lawn, and it's not for convenience. I mean, it's just it's just cuz like you just and everybody's got like six cars and two of them run, and that's just how it works. And as a little kid, I remember my dad would send me out into the driveway uh, to change the license plate from one car to another. We had like six cars and one license plate, and I thought this was like how everybody grew up. And so at like a little kid, my dad would be like, hey, get on out there. Here's a screwdriver. Get on out there and get the tag off the Chevy and put it on a Datsun. We're going to town. And I just assumed like, doesn't everybody do that? Doesn't everybody change the tags on the car before they leave? Um, we settled all our disputes with lots of cussing and violence. It's just a different, a different world. Um, my grandma, th this'll, this will either, you're going to get a new picture of me. My grandma lived in our backyard in a trailer. You know what that does to a kid growing up? Like they literally one day a truck in a trailer hitch pulled her entire home and just put it in our backyard. And it was there the whole time I was growing up. And, and so one year I was about, I think it was fifth grade, I was about 10 years old. I had a couple friends over and we were having a fifth grade World Series in my backyard. And if you grew up playing sports, you know the deal. Like, right, you've shot the game winning shot in your driveway and you've thrown the... Super Bowl winning touchdown pass. And if you ever played baseball, you know the scenario, right? You're up to bat, game seven of the World Series, right? Two outs, bottom of the ninth, the crowd's cheering, the whole thing, okay? I go yard, right? I, I kill this thing. It may or may not have grazed grandma's trailer. I don't remember, but we start celebrating, we start celebrating, we've just won the fifth grade World Series. We're high-fiving, we're yelling, we're partying. And all of a sudden, about eight feet away from us, we hear a 12 gauge shotgun was fired into the air about eight feet away from three 10 year olds. This is true, I'm not making this up. We look over and it is grandma on this little wooden rickety porch coming out of her trailer. And this was how we communicated. And, we, and I went like this, I said, Grandma? And she said, shut the beep up. <laughs> Fires another shot. <laughs> One shot, a bit much. Two definitely not needed, <laughs> right? <laughs> and I couldn't figure out growing up why kids didn't want to come over to my house and play more often. And I'm telling you, there are two grown men right now somewhere in the world still in extensive counseling, <laughs> talking about an old lady who shot a shotgun next to their heads when they were 10. I mean, and that was just like, I honestly grew up going, isn't that how everybody works? I tell you all that because I want to I set something up here. So about 15 years later, my grandma found out that she was dying. And... 
I had just gotten saved and started interning uh, to become a pastor. And so I was the only man in my entire family that had anything to do with God. And so like overnight, I became the family counselor. Some of you know what that's like. You're like the one person who like pursues God in your family. So now everybody wants to talk to you about their problems. And people would really in my family want to like, what do you think I should do? I'm like, dude, I was buying Coke two weeks ago. Do you really want to talk to me about your problems? I mean, that's what I'm thinking. But overnight, I became the family counselor. And my grandma, knowing that she was about to die, it's one of the only real serious conversations I ever remember having with her. And one day she said to me, she said, because Sean, um, I lived a good life, right? And my heart just started to sink because you know what she was doing, right? I know what she was doing. She's, she's, she's at the end and she's looking back and she's, she's starting to wonder, like, did I do anything? I did some good things, right? I, I made a difference, right? I had meaning and purpose, right? Didn't I? What a horrible feeling to one day look back and have to really wonder. And she's probably starting to think about her funeral because she knew that we were already all getting ready to start planning it. And we don't like to think about our funeral because somehow we just go through life pretending we're going to live forever most of the time, right? But if you ever do think about your funeral, we all want the same thing at our funeral, right? We want a packed room, and a long line for the microphone. That's what we want, right? We hope. I want to think that my life was so impactful, so meaningful, it made such a difference in other people's lives that when I'm gone, a whole bunch of people would want to come and celebrate. I want to think that that's how I'm living. And if somebody up front says, here, we're going to put an open mic up here, and if, the, if this person like really went out of their way to make a difference in your life, why don't you come up here and share? And we, we hope, we want to think it'd be a packed room and a real long line for the mic, right? That's our hope. Because we all want the same thing. We want a life that matters. We crave purpose. And that's what my grandma was doing when she asked me that question. She's saying, Sean, did I have some purpose? Did I, did I have some meaning? And my grandma was an awesome lady, and she went through some really, really difficult things in life. I got to spend 25 years with her. Of those 25 years, um, there wasn't a whole lot that I could think of. Uh, she, she, was, she was sort of kept to herself. She didn't like to be disturbed. Um, I know she, she loved us. We knew she loved us, but she didn't like to be disturbed. She had a routine. She knew what she liked, and she didn't want that routine to get messed up very often. And here she is asking me, have I led a meaningful life? And I'm thinking, I'm racking my brain. I'm not going to say anything, but I'm racking my brain. I'm trying to think, like, when are the moments when she made a difference, when she made an impact? And the only day I could think of was the day she made some noise. That was it. And one day, you're going to look back on the, on the bulk of your life and how you'll be remembered is going to be based on whether or not you decided to make some noise. You are called, not someday, you are called today to make some noise for the kingdom of heaven. To take what you've been given, to take the life change that you've experienced and to turn around and on purpose, start making some noise with it. Start serving people and loving people and helping people and inviting people and sharing your story. Whatever it is, every situation's different. God, put some people in my life and give me an opportunity. Help me make some real noise for you. That's what we're called to do. And if you'll live this way, because, see, I think this is it's kind of like one of those things Carl talked about last night. This is one of those things that a whole bunch of us church people go, that's a great idea. But when it comes to putting in the work and the sacrifice to actually live that way, it's a whole different thing. If you and me will choose to actually live this way, it'll change the way we live. It'll change the way we'll be remembered. And it really will allow every single one of us to be a part 
of making heaven more crowded. Not just go to a church where we say that's what we care about, but to actually be able to say, no, that's what my life is about. It's a whole different thing to say, yeah, that's, what we're, that's what's important to us. That's what's on the poster. That's what we tell. No, no, that's how I live. And let me show you how it's changed things. Let me show you who it's already affected. Let me show you how God has used it. And Jesus went so far out of his way to make sure that you and I understood that this is supposed to be job one for us. It's the very first thing he ever told his disciples. Do you know that? The first day he said, come follow me. It's the first thing he said. Matthew 4, 19, come follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. He said, if you follow me, here's what you're going to do. I'm going to make this real clear right up front. You're going to take what I'm going to do in your life and you're going to turn around and you're going to get loud with it and you're going to share it with the people around you. This world's going to know you're here and it's going to know that I'm your God. You're going to make some noise. If you're going to be my follower, you don't have to follow, but if you're going to be my follower, here's how it's defined. First thing he ever said. I would argue it's the topic that he taught more passionately than anything else he taught. If you read Luke chapter 15, you'll see a story, or three actually, right in a row. Uh, lost sheep, lost coin, lost son. There's no other topic that Jesus taught about where he said, I'm going I'm to I'm take a minute and I'm going to tell you three stories in a row to make this point. No other topic. And, it, and, and the, the fact that he told them three stories in a row, it wasn't arbitrary. Hebrew, which the rabbis would be very familiar with, there is no word in the Hebrew language for our word very, right? So we would say something's very good. You can go to Dairy Queen today and you can get a blizzard that is half cookie dough, half Oreo with one squirt of fudge. And you will say it is very, very good. That's what we would say, right? And we put exclamation points on the end of things. In the Hebrew language, you don't use exclamation points and you don't say very. So in the Hebrew language, if you want to say something's very, very good, you say it three times. You say it's good, good, good. When we read about the angels in heaven singing, holy, 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 they're not saying it three times. That's the way you put exclamation points on something. They're saying, holy. So Jesus says, let me put some exclamation points on this. Let me show you it's very, very, very important. Let me tell you three times so that you get it, so that you know exactly what you're called to do because I don't want there to be any confusion. It's the first thing he said. It's what he taught, I believe, more passionately than any other subject matter. And it's the very last thing he said. Matthew 28, 19. Jesus has already been crucified been buried, put in the tomb. On the third day, he comes back to life. He appears to over 500 eyewitnesses because he knew that he was going to start his church and it was gonna be based on a historical event. Not like any other major world religion where a guy says, I can't prove it, but I just, I heard from God, come trust me. No, Jesus said, no, 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 no. My, my church is gonna be based on an event in history and I'm gonna give you over 500 eyewitnesses so that this can never be disproven. And then right before he goes back up into heaven, he says, don't forget. Don't forget job one. Remember, it's the first thing I told you. Remember how passionately I taught you. Don't forget job one. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. I love that he ends it with, I'm with you. Because he knows what he's asking is a tall task. He knows what he's asking, truth be told, scares most of us to death. And so he says, don't forget, this is job one for you. But don't, also don't forget, I'm going with you. I'm empowering you. My spirit will be in you. I'll lead the conversation. I'll show you where to go. I'll show you what to do. You just be available. And so the question I started asking myself this week real honestly, painfully honestly is, and it's the same question I want to ask you. If this is job one, then how come you don't live that way? 
Now, some of you would go, dude, you don't know. Like, that's all I'm about. But I bet you for a whole bunch of us, me included, I can't say that, honestly, most days. Because it's just not. It's a cool thing. It's a great thing to talk about at church. I love hearing about it. It's, it sounds great. It's not actually how I live. And that's why I asked Jess to have you start writing down. And in fact, as I'm talking, if, if you start to realize there's a few other things that I think that might keep me from being excited about or brave enough to share my faith, keep writing those things down while I'm talking. I knew that I was going to be talking about this. And so I've been, I, I made my own list. And I started getting real, real serious and honest with myself and going, okay, God, what? Why don't I live like this is job one for me? And I'll I'll give you my list. I got a top five. The first one is I'm selfish. See, I get paid to talk about Jesus. I get paid to have meetings with people all week long, talk about Jesus. I don't get paid to talk about Jesus at Starbucks, at the gym, at the kids' games, in the neighborhood at the family get-togethers. That's my time. I'm off work. That's my time. And, if I, and I know if I get into a conversation with somebody about Jesus, like God knows where this conversation's gonna go and how long it's gonna take, and I got things to do. That's honestly how I feel. And I thought, you know what? One of the main reasons why I don't actually live this way, why I don't actually think a whole bunch about what God has done for me and who can I share that with today is because I'm just selfish and I hate it about myself. I'm insecure. I'm not supposed to admit that, but I am. Most people in my life know that I work at a church. When I go to my kids' games, most of the parents know that's the guy who works at the church. When I'm in the gym, I can't tell you how many times people go, oh yeah, he's a church guy. And so I get real insecure, like if I, if I bring up Jesus, it's going to be like, here comes a church guy, hide your wallets, run, the Jesus freak, whatever. And I start thinking, like, what are they going to think about me? And what are they going to say? And what if they don't respond? And what if, what if they've got some, like, real big baggage and pain from the past about church and Jesus and they don't understand? And I get so worried about what somebody might think. I just stay quiet. I don't want to be a hypocrite. And see, if I spend much time with you, you'll see my flaws real quick. And some of the people I most care about in my life, they've seen me screw up big time. They've seen me make huge mistakes. They've seen me do things wrong, say things wrong, treat people wrong. And so knowing all my faults, now turning around to somebody and going, hey, can I share my faith? Like It just doesn't feel right. And I think, I don't want to be a hypocrite. I'm just not good enough. I'll pray that somebody would, would lead these people to Christ. I'll pray that they miraculously find Jesus. I'm just not good enough to be part of that. I predetermine who God can and can't save. There's just certain people in my life that I go, I could, but what's the point? As if I know what God's doing in their heart at that moment. And see, that's one of the things, that's one of the temptations in living in a city like Denver. When I moved here to be a part of the startup of this church, one of the things I loved was that at that time, I haven't looked at the studies recently, but at that time, Denver was the highest bachelor degree per capita of any city in the country, which means we are surrounded by well-off people in Denver. And so what we do is we just look around and we predetermine. Well, they don't need anything, and they don't need anything, and they don't need anything, and they definitely wouldn't be receptive. That's what I do. I predetermine who God can and can't reach. And the last thing for me is is I just worry that uh, they're going to ask me questions and I'm not going to know the answers. You ever feel that one? I didn't grow up hearing all the stories in church. I don't have a Bible degree. I didn't go to seminary. Yet I felt called to be a pastor, which is crazy to me. But I get real scared that they're going to ask some questions and I don't know the answers. And I'm a pastor. Aren't I supposed to know answers? And so I just won't say anything. I just keep quiet. And see, you've got your list. 
I've got my list. And if we're not, not careful, what you've written down in your journal will be the very thing that keeps you from experiencing the stuff God has for you. What you've written down, what you've been thinking about, can be the very thing that keeps you from that long line at the microphone someday, from being able to make a difference in some people's lives, to live a life of influence and meaning and purpose. In Acts chapter 4, there's a couple guys that had to make this same decision. Do I speak up? Do I shut up? It actually starts in, in, in Acts chapter 3, and you can read it for yourself. Peter and John, this crazy thing happens, and God does a miracle, and a whole bunch of people gather around, and they decide, I'm going to speak up. And they start publicly sharing their faith. The religious leaders and the political leaders, they catch wind of this. They do not like it. Because if you remember, it's the religious leaders and the political leaders that had Jesus crucified. So... If we had Jesus crucified, you can't have people running around saying Jesus came back to life and he's actually God because that makes me look pretty stupid. Nobody wants on their resume, I killed God, right? It doesn't, nobody wants that. So they get real upset that these guys are talking about Jesus. So they have him arrested, put in prison. The next day, they bring him to what we would think of as like a, the courthouse. They say, we're going to have a talk. And they threaten him. They threaten them with their lives. Us, the biggest threat we can think of is like, oh no, they might put me in prison or something like that. These guys, no, no, when, they threat, when these guys threaten you, it's for your life. It's to be tortured, to be whipped, to be beaten, to be stoned, to be crucified, to be taken out in public and set on fire. Like that's the kind of stuff they're being threatened with. And watch how they respond. And listen, Chad just talked about this passage last week in church. We're not talking about spiritual giants here. We're talking about a couple of fishermen who gave their lives to Jesus and have zero education for this kind of thing. And listen to what they said when their lives are threatened. Acts 4, 18 through 20. They called them back and warned them that they were on no account ever again to speak or teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John spoke right back. Whether it's right in God's eyes to listen to you rather than God, you decide. As for us, there's no question. We can't keep quiet about what we've seen and heard. You can scare us. You can put me in prison. You can stone me, beat me, whip me, burn me, crucify me. But I'll tell you what you can't do. You can't keep me quiet. God's done too much in my life to hold on to this one, to keep this a secret. You just can't keep me quiet. And then these guys, so they threaten them with their lives. They release them. They say, you talk about Jesus one more time, you die. They go back and meet up with a couple of friends that day and watch what they prayed. Acts 4.29. Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. They don't run back and go, God, protect us. Keep us comfortable. Keep us safe. Bless us. Take away our fears. They go back and get with some of their best friends, and they say, no, 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 no. You called me to make some noise, so then you give me the courage to do it. That's what I want. And look, there's nothing wrong with us praying, God, help me, bless me, protect me. Give me a boyfriend, a girlfriend, a job, a promotion, a thing. Help. But can I just be honest for a second? For some of you, that's all you pray. Like start thinking about the last few times you've sat down to pray. and How much of that is dominated by help me, bless me, comfort me, promote me. There's nothing wrong with those prayers. But what if every time you prayed that, you didn't end until you said, and use me. Give me courage. Give me boldness. Give me opportunities. Put people in front of me. Give me the courage to step into the fire, into the darkness, into my job, into my school, into my family, into my neighborhood. Give me the boldness to go there and speak boldly about you. Think about what God could do with your life if that's the kind of prayers that you started to pray. Peter and John would end up being... Two of the most 
significant men in the history of mankind. They didn't know it. They're just living their life. 2,000 years. Their lives were so great, so meaningful, that 2,000 years later, we literally are on the mic talking about how great they are. Like, that's a great life, right? What's the secret? Because obviously stuff like this is like, it's, it's encouraging, it's inspiring, but, but, but we're just ordinary us. What's the secret? Where do you even get the courage to go to God and ask for the courage to go make a difference? Because sometimes I don't even know how to get that. And see, I think for them, I think, I think they look back on a whole lot of times with Jesus, but I think one of the things they would do is they would look back at the day that Jesus told them that he was going to build a church that they were going to be a part of. And I think that in and of itself would help them remember the kind of power that they have within them. I'm going to read a verse that a whole bunch of you have heard before, a whole bunch of you have read this before, you've heard people talk about it. I want to share a little bit of context that might give you a slightly different view of this verse. Matthew 16, 18. I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I know a bunch of you have heard that verse. And, and I believe with that statement, Jesus, there's a whole bunch of nuances. There's a whole bunch of things that he's communicating to his best friends at that moment. But let me give you a picture of what I believe one of them is. When Jesus said that, they're on their way to Caesarea Philippi. Every rabbi knows you don't go to Caesarea Philippi because this is like evil and pagan to the hills. Like you just don't go there. The stuff that's going on there, if you're a God-fearing person, you don't go anywhere near Caesarea Philippi. There was this cave near the entrance of Caesarea Philippi. Out of this cave, was a, it was a natural spring. So certain times of year, water would literally flow out of this cave. So a long time ago, some people decided that water must be coming from the depths of hell. And it's as the result of our God, Pan, the God of fertility. He's sending water up out of the earth to water things, to make things fertile. And so because this place was so evil, so pagan, so anti-God, they started doing rituals around the mouth of this cave where this water would come from. Stuff that to us today, it's either unspeakable, like it's, you don't even think about it. They would literally take their newborn babies to this cave and they would sacrifice them near the entrance to the God of fertility. While babies are being murdered, they would start having orgies around the entrance and then they would bring animals into it. And bestiality was happening. I mean, there's sex with animals. Babies are being murdered. Orgies. All of this to this pan, this God of fertility. Like, it's evil and paganism on a level that's hard for us to even really fathom. And everybody also knew what they called that cave. That cave was called the Gates of Hades. Now picture this. Jesus is walking up to Caesarea Philippi with some of his best friends. And he says, guys, I'm going to build a church. It's you. You're going to make up the church. I'm going to build a church. And there is no evil in the world. Not even the most evil place we've ever seen or heard about. There is no evil in the world that can stop what I'm about to do through you. You can't be stopped because I'll go with you. So let them threaten you. Let them yell. Let them talk. Let them do whatever they want. You can't be stopped. Go make some noise. And there they are outside the gates of Hades at Caesarea Philippi. Young adults, I love to talk all the time about how God's got a plan for you. Because he does. Sometimes what we don't realize is there's a flip side to that coin. Satan has a plan for you. Do you know that? He wants to kill and steal and destroy the destiny right off your life. He wants you to get to the end of your life and ask that question, I lived a good life, right? And already know the answer. I didn't do anything. That's what he wants. And listen, he can't steal your salvation away. So you know what Satan's hope for your life is? 
Christ following Red Rocks young adults. You know what Satan's hope for your life is? That you'll just stay saved and quiet. You can stay saved as long as you just don't do anything with it. Then nobody at your school will be affected. And nobody at your work will be affected. And nobody in your family will be affected. And nobody in your neighborhood will be affected. Satan's hope for us is that we'll just stay saved and quiet. And God says, no, 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 no. I got a plan for you. I've got a calling for you. I'm calling you to make some noise. That list that you wrote, that's all Satan has. That's what he wants to use. Whatever it is you just wrote down, that's all he's got. And he'll just whisper it in your ear. You can't do something like that. You're just not good enough. You're not smart enough. Who knows what they'll say? They'll think you're a hypocrite. That's all he's got. Threats, little empty threats that he can whisper in your ear. And God knows. And so he says this, Matthew 10, 26 through 28. Don't be intimidated. Eventually, everything is going to be out in the open and everyone will know how things really are. So don't hesitate to go public now. Don't be bluffed into silence. Don't be bluffed into silence by the threats of bullies. There's nothing they can do to your soul, your core being, save your fear for God who holds the, uh, your entire life, body, and soul in his hands. Satan has nothing but empty threats, little bluffs that he wants to whisper in your ear. But if we're not careful, he'll get his wish and we'll stay saved and quiet. And God says, mm mm you're part of my church that I'm building. My spirit is in you and there's nothing in this world that can stop you. You don't have to know what to say. You don't have to know exactly what to do. You just have to be willing because remember, I'm going with you. Just go make some noise. There's this one verse that, that we did an entire teaching series on a while back and this verse should describe who we are as a family. Matthew eleven twelve. 12, from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has been forcefully advancing and forceful men lay hold of it. We should be waking up with a spirit of aggression. We're empowered by the creator of the universe. Look what he's already done in your life. Miracles are possible. All we got to do is say, I'm willing and I'll go live life today and you give me the opportunity and I will speak up. And you can threaten me and you can say stupid things because that's all you got. You can't keep me quiet. You want to get to the very end? You want to have a packed room, and a long line to the mic? You want to be a part of making heaven more crowded? This is where it starts. I'm a believer in Jesus Christ and I will not be quiet. That's it. I'm a believer in Jesus Christ, and I will not be quiet. Look, we've all got our reasons why we shouldn't be the ones to be used. But let me just give you some reasons why you should. Because this isn't a game. Look around. There's millions of people around us in this city. Everywhere we go, good people, loving people, caring people, good dads, good moms, brothers, sisters... Apart from Jesus Christ, they're going to hell forever. This is not a game. And what we have been given inside of us could help them see the light. It could change their eternity. It's not a game. I got nervous about talking to you guys about this subject today because most of you go to the church and this is what I love to talk about. And so you've heard me talk about this before, a whole bunch of you. And so I literally was on my knees in my office going, God, I don't know how to take what's in here and transfer that. I don't know how to say it any different than I've already said it a hundred times. And I was like, God, how, how, do you, how do you feel when you watch us process this? And I don't know if this is from God or not, or it's just because I'm a dad and it's just what I thought of. Band, you guys can come on up. 
I thought, I thought about my three boys, Ethan, Austin, and Ashton. And to a fault, I probably give them more than I should. I love doing stuff with them and for them. I love blessing them with stuff. And I thought, what if Ashton, the seven-year-old, went missing? Like, like not for 15, 20 minutes, which happens on a regular basis. <laughs> like, like 24 hours. Okay, you, you have a seven-year-old who goes missing for 24 hours. I think your life literally shatters. And what if I go into the living room and, and Ethan and Austin are there? And one's on his phone that I gave him. And one's on his iPad that I gave him. And they're watching TV. They're watching SpongeBob. God knows I don't need more of that show in my life. <laughs> but what if I come in and I'm like, guys, I don't know any other way to ask you to get involved. Ashton's missing. Please, will you come help me find your brother? And what if they looked back at me and they said, we're too busy, Dad. God, thanks for the iPad. Let me finish this show. Thanks for all your blessings, Dad. I'm so comfy right now. And as a dad, I would be mad and all these things. But I'll tell you what I would be more than anything. I would be so heartbroken that my children don't understand the importance of going and finding the one that's missing. It's what we're called to do, guys. We're so blessed. God's given us so much. But heaven and hell, it's real. That's why Jesus got so fired up when he talked about it. He's given us this church, and this family, and these opportunities. There's people all over. And so I'm, I'm just, I'm begging you. Would you start praying for boldness? Would you start saying, God, show me the person, and then give me the courage. And I don't need to predetermine who is and isn't ready for you. We really can change the world together starts with each one of us going there's one person and I'll go because I am a follower of Jesus Christ and you can't keep me quiet let me pray for you <clears throat> God I feel like in, in so many ways like we're on the couch right now and you're calling us God forgive me for all the times when I've been too busy too wrapped up in all my blessings to go outside and look. God, we're so thankful for what you've done for us and we do such a good job sometimes of being grateful. And I pray now, God, you would help us to turn around and take what you've done in our lives and share it with this world. God, I believe that this church family can change the world. And I pray for boldness that you would help us to go and speak your word in love but with boldness. And I thank you for that, God. I thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Sorry. Will you guys stand up? Let's worship a little.